I'm a neurologist. I run the Neuromuscular Center and the ALS program at uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm just going to talk about our efforts to do cellular and animal modeling in, in C9. And I'm going to skip over everything you've heard about the background because I think we know it by now. Um, C9 is obviously extremely common in both sporadic or apparently sporadic ALS as well as familial cases. Um, and the nature of the mutation has is, is been discussed uh, and as have been the possible mechanisms, either loss of function, haploid sufficiency, or various toxic gain of function properties such as RNA foci, RAN peptides. Um, I like the suggestion that it's actually just in LD with some other mutation that's on the haplotype and we still possible, I suppose. I'm ho yeah, good. Yeah, I didn't think, uh, I'm hoping not. <laughs> or else we spent a lot of money on stuff that wasn't worth it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, you've seen all of this. Obviously, in the first reports by Rosa, there were, there were foci shown, and, and uh, then not long afterwards from both Dieter Edbauer group as well as Lenz group, the, the ran peptides, and, and then Laura. Um, so those were the, you know, pretty strong evidence for gain of function as well as analogies, as many have pointed out to other diseases, myotonic dystrophy and so forth. Um, but then, of course, there's this, this decreased level. Uh, this is from Rose's paper. Um, and then a bunch of other studies, uh, you know, several looking at, uh, it was already pointed out but from a couple of different groups, that epigenetic modification leads to decreased expression of the locus. Um, and then, as I think has also been implied but not discussed in detail, we're just now starting to see some mechanistic studies on what C9 does and is the suggestion that it's involved in endocytosis and autophagy is quite interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll be interested to see if that continues to be borne out. Uh, and, you know, it, the deletion, at least in C. elegans, has some phenotype. Um, and that's a genetic deletion, I, I believe. So it seems like that's not going to go away by a different methodology. So there's probably something to this. And, and it's, it's quite a question. Um, you know, I'm hoping that human genetics can help. Um, this is our somewhat feeble attempts at doing that, <laughs> which is just to look at uh, sequencing of the gene. And, and when we did this in the cohorts in St. Louis, so in the Midwest as well as in the Northwest, uh, John Ravitz's cohort, you know, obviously we saw that it's extremely common in those populations, actually, which was remarkable, about 10% in, in the Midwest of our sporadic cases carry this mutation. Um, and then, of course, these, these asymptomatic uh, expansion carriers are also very interesting. But we didn't find any pathogenic mutations in all of those, and, and uh, uh, Orla Hardeman's group has looked as well, and I think others hopefully are looking, because this could certainly put a nail in the coffin if we find a premature stop codon that looks like progranulin. Um, so, you know, uh, absence of proof does not proof of absence make, as I have to practice to say that saying. Um, it, it doesn't mean that that's not the case, but this certainly argues against it, and I, I would hope that we continue to make this effort, um, because if we do find one, it could change the way we think about all of this. Um, but I think the other per perhaps direction it'll go, and this is not our work, but, but Eddie Lee's group actually had a paper just came out like a, a two couple weeks ago, at least showing that in, in patients that they have a methylation assay that's inversely correlated with the degree of, of foci. So suggesting that the two processes are opposed to each other, which opens up, I think, an interesting possibility that in fact the methylation of the allele is a protective effect and that what could explain these percentage of patients who don't manifest uh, ALS or FTD and they carry it would be that they actually silence the allele to some degree. And that's a, an answerable question that, I, that we're not actually working on because we don't have the patient material to do it, but I think it's several of the groups who have the brain banks and so forth and the right methylation assays, and that's going to be a challenge, to look at that. May, this may also be able to answer the question because the model organisms, as you'll see shortly, are likely not going to answer the question would be my... <laughs> Suggestion. So, so um, what did we do? You know, we, we, so I'm going to talk about our IPS cell work, and then I'll finish off with some of the mouse modeling that we've been doing. Um, the IPS work is published, of course. The mouse modeling work is extremely preliminary and not published at all. So, um, enjoy the the lab meeting grade figures. Um, so, you know, in terms of the IPS models, I think it's certainly attractive. As many of you know, in large part, if nothing else, because we don't have to try and clone a thousand repeats of GGGCC and stick them into a cDNA and make an artificial model, we can actually use the endogenous human element. We can't piece apart some of the other aspects of it 
um, as carefully as, as what you've heard from Adrian and so forth by inserting stop codons, but we can at least ask whether, um, you know, is there a phenotype in the motor neurons? And then, of course, is expression altered by the re uh, repeat? And then is there gain of function, loss of function in these cells? And what might that tell us about, you know, the human disease? So we were able to do four different patients. Um, here's shown the southern blots, which are, uh, as Don Cleveland has, has commented, as ugly as everybody else's southern blots because um, these are, can be challenging. I've seen some better ones, though, recently. We need to probably change our technology. But the fibroblasts that we made these from generally carried repeats in the range of, of 800. Um, and in fact, I've seen on quite a few others, and that seems to be common in fibroblasts, somewhere around that range. You never see these very high expansions that you see in brain. Um, with the exception of one, this was only 70 repeats. Uh, and this individual, although it's not worth a lot, was actually the, had the youngest onset in her 40s and had very severe ALS and FTD died within two years of onset, whereas these other individuals had a very more typical ALS course. Um, I actually took care of three of the four of them, um, so I knew them pretty well. So their fibroblasts didn't show much of a difference, although I guess some, we, we said some somatic instability, you see slight increases in size, and then in this particular individual we looked at motor neurons, it sort of becomes uh, polymorphic in those cells, whether that's, you know, uh, a clonal selection or some other process, we don't know exactly. But so we start with these, and, and this has been pointed out before that, that you know, fibroblasts themselves are not clonal, but clearly the iPS cells are. Um, and so the best we can do is, is whatever repeat size we have in those patients, but they're certainly a lot larger than most of the artificial things that can be made. These are the so traditional, you can make iPS cells on the left, and then on the right, just that we made motor neurons. Just to point out, this is a pretty typical iPS differentiation protocol that leads to a mixed population of motor neurons and other cell types, glial cell types. Um, interneurons. This is not a pure motor neuron uh, culture. Um, but when we did the best to look at sort of survival of these cells, we didn't see a survival phenotype. And we also didn't see uh, abnormalities in TDP43 staining or any other typical pathology one would expect uh, in motor neurons from ALS patients. Um, and perhaps one could, you know, easily argue that that's because these are embryonic motor neurons and embryonic ALS patients don't have a phenotype. So we went forward and asked these other questions, and I'll start moving a little faster. I mean, because this is out there, you know, we see a slight decrease in the levels of C9 expression overall. Um, we actually looked pretty carefully at the protein, and, and even though the antibodies are really bad, we later sort of confirmed these with ASOs, that these bands were the ones that we said they were. And at the protein level, although it's not very good, if, if anything, it was slightly increased, but I think it just means that we couldn't detect a difference in the RNA levels or protein levels of C9 in these patient-derived, IPS-derived motor neurons. Um, we, did, we did a lot of effort to actually look at these upstream transcripts, and that's because I was very concerned with PCR-based method for detection, um, and you'll see why in a second. And so we actually used a technique called RACE, where we put reverse primers onto exon 2 and adapted onto the 5' prime end of the transcripts. Therefore, we don't have to bias ourselves to what these transcripts actually are, and then looked in the patients via PCR and sequencing to actually see which isoforms one gets. And what you get is a picture that looks like this from fibroblasts. So out of these 100 sequences that we looked at, 83% of them were 1B derived. There were a couple different forms. And then from 1A, actually, we saw two different forms, neither of which corresponds exactly to the two different um, annotated ones. There's a longer one that went farther 5 prime than the one that's in the database. Um, so we, we sort of looked at both patient fibroblasts as well as IPS cells, and the long and the short of it was it was very surprising. I mean, we, we actually were able to use a SNP in exon 2 that, that actually indicates which is coming from the expansion and which is coming from the wild type, and we found that the wild type looks a lot like a control individual, which is shown here, but that the expansion, if anything, showed more 1A-derived uh, transcripts um, as well as a decrease in these, and this was different uh, significantly, at least in the two carriers or four carriers we had that had this uh, mutation, or sorry, this SNP, rather, in, in exon 2 where we could look at it. Um, and the second property was sort of strange, and that is that it's, it, these bounce around. And this is the origin of my concern with the PCR, because there really is no single PCR primer that one can place to actually look at 1A transcripts from these patients. So there could be, if you were to look at just here, an apparent decrease in 1A when in fact there's an increase in 1A, it's just they're increased in different isoforms. So one has to be a little cautious with that. And we saw this in two different patients who had this, this sort of 
increased size and increased usage of the 1A isoform in the expansion patients. So, you know, I guess from, from that we, we found that we didn't see any evidence at least of loss of function or at least of loss of expression of C9 in these patients. Um, one thing to bring up, of course, is when you make iPS cells, sorry for the animation, you, you, you tend to reverse a lot of epigenetic markers. And so there could be those acquired over time and that we don't actually see that in these cells for that reason. But we turned our attention to these toxic gain of function properties. And um, the first thing, although I'm going to revisit it hopefully with Len, was that we didn't see any insoluble RAND translation products. And this fits with us not seeing a lot of um, P62 positive aggregates, ubiquitin positive aggregates. We didn't see any of that. Um, so when we looked in these and, and bit, did soluble and soluble fractioning and then uh, dot blots, we can certainly see them in C9 ALS patient brains. Uh, however, we did not see any in the, the patient iPS-derived motor neurons. Um, and we did a Huntington control from Huntington patients just to see if our sort of soluble, insoluble fractionation scheme worked. And it seems to work at least for that protein. Um, so my take on this is that these are, if they're present, they're extremely low or they're soluble and they're not insoluble, at least at this stage. Um, but by contrast, we did see a lot of RNA foci, perhaps not surprising because we know that they're in fibroblasts and liver and just about everything else, but they're present here uh, and in pretty significant numbers, um, only in the C9 patients. Here's our co-staining data, which um, Adrian can, can criticize appropriately because these pictures are pretty ugly. But uh, we, we did see at least co-localization with the ones that we looked at, pure alpha having been reported in Drosophila before, HNR and PA1 in about 50% of the, the foci, um, A2B1 at a much smaller level. We've since looked at H um, and uh, SC35, and we don't see co-staining in these cell types. So for what it's worth. Um, and as everybody else, we really don't see any for FUS and TDP43, so direct connection can't really be made in these motor neurons. Another comment to make, by the way, with lower motor neurons, you don't see a lot of RAND pathology. I should have pointed this out on the previous slide. So we, we went through a lot of effort to make lower motor neurons. You don't see them in the humans. That might be why we don't also see them in the tissue culture. Um, but anyway, so what did we see? Well, we did a lot of profiling, and we found a series of genes which were differentially expressed. Uh, in the C9 patient samples versus controls, um, the most interesting of which were a couple DPP6, which has sort of shown up and disappeared in GWAS studies for ALS before. And it's actually a, a trafficking protein for another one of these genes, KCNQ3, a potassium channel. And so at least for, these others are involved in synaptic development. So we were interested in whether there was an altered electrophysiology on these cells. So we collaborated with uh, a group at UCLA and showed that, in fact, there is hypoexcitability of these ALS patient motor neurons uh, from C9 patients versus controls. It's fitting with the concept that there's an increased expression of a potassium channel at the surface of the cells. We've not yet made that connection, in other words, manipulated that potassium channel and shown that we can re reverse this, um, but we're in the process of trying to do that. Um, so getting to this, this next thing that, that Clotilde will probably talk about a little bit tomorrow, you know, regardless of the mechanism, we worked with ISIS uh, to d investigate whether antisense oligonucleotides could, could approach this problem and, and diminish these toxic gain of function properties. And so we, we, as you know, if you make antisense oligonucleotides, they can be recognized in the nucleus by RNASH and degrade them, and we were hoping that we could actually get rid of these foci. So we, we know that we can knock down with, a, with one that targets in exon 2, which are all isoforms essentially to a very low percentage or one that targets just upstream of the repeat, you still get a knockdown, a partial knockdown of the overall expression of the gene, but not as much. Um, and we actually used 5' prime race to sort of confirm this phenomenon that in, in this case, if you have scramble, you're having mostly 1A isoforms, and that if you treat with this ASO, you get a shift towards mostly 1B, presumably by degrading these 1A isoforms. So, you know, this loss of function question, again, we treated the, the, with this ASO that knocks down to about 10% for a couple of weeks, and at least as a survival phenotype, we don't see anything wrong with human motor neurons. So, you know, we can knock down the, AS, the uh, foci, and we looked a lot at a lot of these gene transcriptional changes, which in this case, each has shown ones that go up in the, in the C9 patients, which were reversed and brought back down, although not completely to normal. Uh, and we went ahead and did essentially an RNA-seq version of this same experiment, and you see definitively a partial correction of these transcriptional changes. 
um, it, probably the best block being here where they were red here and the scramble treated moving towards blue. Um, so there's, it, across many of the genes, not just the ones that I showed you, there is a partial reversal, but it's clearly partial. Um, so, you know, in terms of the mechanistic work, I, I don't know what the particular RNA binding protein, if any RNA binding protein is relevant for this RNA toxicity. You know, it, it, it certainly is attractive to make the analogies to myotonic dystrophy where even if TDP43 is not the abnormal one, it could be, um, you know, essentially the binding partner of muscle blind that gets disrupted uh, when HNRMPA1 or H or one of these other proteins becomes altered and then changes its function. Um, so I still, I still think that's certainly possible. Alternatively, then it could be RAN peptides and so forth. And I, I'm still pretty agnostic about these, uh, as many of you are, and I think the need to do a lot more experiments mechanistically rather than just looking at the patient cells to figure this out. So uh, moving on, you know, we, we were really interested in doing some animal modeling um, and in mice, because we, we like mice, uh, so we did a couple of different approaches, and, and we, we actually obtained uh, from COMP a knockout allele of C9 uh, shortly after it was discovered. It, all you really needed to do, of course, was to, to search what the mouse homolog is named at 311, what was it, it's almost as bad as C9, um, and this allele was sitting there. There's a couple of ES clones at the, the NIH-funded COMP project, um, and so we ordered these, and, and um, as have several other groups, and, and there's a, I think we're going to start seeing reports on these. But they're pretty clearly a knockout. They remove exons, I think, two through six. Um, they insert a LAC-Z, and you can see at the RNA level and brain and spinal cord, the hemizygotes are half as much, and you don't see any RNA uh, in the homozygotes. And then with Western blotting, um, these antibodies actually work a lot better on mouse, so, so you can convincingly show there's absolutely no C9 protein. We only see the long isoform. We don't see the short isoform in the mice, so I'm not sure, uh, you know, what that indicates. So, you know, phenotyping-wise, at this point, we don't see any premature death. We have a large number of hemizygotes and homozygotes that are out to 12 months. Uh, some hemizygotes that are 15 months, they're pretty happy. They, they seem, they might be psychotic, but they're, uh, uh, that's harder to tell. Um, and, it, you know, so I'll just show you some quick data that we've done. I mean, we, we did RNA-seq on the spinal cords of these mice, thinking, well, you know, we can't see anything wrong with them, but maybe with the RNA-seq we'll see some pathways that are disrupted, because you always see pathways that are disrupted, so we'll find something. And if you, we took three wild types, hets and homos. This is just some RNA-seq from the actual C9 locus. And this is the, the 1B, I think. The 1A is not annotated in mice, but it does exist. Actually, we confirmed it with the race. Um, and you can see, at least with exon 2, you know, these are clearly hemizygotes, and these are clearly homozygous loss. Um, so when you do differential gene expression, I, I, I probably should have brought a volcano plot or something similar. But the bottom line is, you know, with a false discovery rate of 0.05, there is only one gene different between the wild type or the C9 knockouts, that being C9. Um, if you increase it to 0.5, there's still only one gene. I mean, you really have to push this to, uh, uh, you know, a 75% or an 80% to start to get 10 genes, you know. And it's, it's actually remarkable how similar these are. And principal component analysis is pretty much a scatter plot. It's not able to determine the difference between controls, hemizygous, or homozygotes. And if you do, um, you know, non-supervised hierarchical clustering, you find the same thing. The, the white air controls, the tan or the hemizygotes, and the homozygotes are red, and they're all over the board. Now, this is a little bit young of an animal, um, but I suppose that even if this gene had some function that couldn't be compensated for, I was expecting to see something. So this is a little surprising. We're, we're, we're trying to get large enough cohorts that are aged to do good behavioral studies and see if there's a very subtle phenotype. But we're not seeing a rip-roaring phenotype, and, and I'll have to see the other data that's out there to figure out why that is. Um, these were f actually five months, four or five months, yeah. So, so on the converse side, we wanted to, to investigate these, these gain-of-function manifestations. And so we took the approach to generate a back transgenic. Um, as many others have as well, it turns out. 
But um, we did patient 28. This is uh, uh, one of the patients I showed you before. So this was their southern blot, and this was the fibroblast that we derived these from. And we had to screen a very large number of clones, and we found seven that contained the entire genomic region. Of those, only one contained the expanded repeat. And what we found is that even uh, culturing these backs uh, two passages or one passage, you will get a tendency towards contraction in bacteria. Bacteria very much love to contract this back. Um, so you have to be very cautious the way you grow them and try different strains and so forth. But we were able to get um, somewhere we actually got these into mice. Um, and you get a very interesting picture in the southern blots for these back founders, which is you get uh, multiple different insertion sizes. So you'll get ones, probably five or six backs went in. Um, remarkably, these are, these are F1s, and we've shown through F2 this pattern is, continues. So this has gone in as a transgene array. And they have some that are essentially in the normal range, but others that are extremely large, actually even larger than they were when they went in uh, or they were come from the patient. Um, sometimes we'll get a single band, uh, and, you know, but, but the tendency is to have lots of these, several with some single bands. And then we actually have some that we made with the back that contracted in bacteria to two repeats. So it's sort of an isogenic control. This is a back that has two repeats on the disease haplotype. So we made mice with those as well. Um, and what you can see is expression of uh, the C9. This is human C9. These are the mouse. This is human. So several of these ones that have multiple bands, these are to indicate the band sizes, um, are, are in this range. This is our two-repeat control. It's about the same. Um, it correlates pretty well in terms of the mRNA expression levels with the number of insertions that you have. Um, but interestingly, as, you, as I'll show little bits of data, there, the other aspects, these, these foci and so forth, don't. So um, take note of this one here. This one has a s relatively small repeat, uh, a single insertion on the southern blot, um, but actually makes foci at a range close to these. Um, when you look at the protein levels, it, it didn't vary as much, in fact. So, so this is the two-repeat control. This is one of the uh, ones that has multiple insertion sizes, some high, some low. And the overall protein levels coming from this back are about the same. But this will be a useful control, I think, because there's always the possibility when you make your transgenic back that uh, overexpressing C9 will do something. Um, so at least with the protein level, we have a pretty good control that, that uh, without the repeat. So what do you see? You see sense foci in the mice. You can see them in frontal cortex, motor cortex, dentate gyrus, cerebellum, et cetera. Um, you can see antisense foci in the same cell types. Um, and if you uh, quantitate these, you do see some variability, as I was mentioning. These are quantitated in the dentate gyrus, but uh, where sense and antisense, these are two of the relatively high level expressing lines. Um, this is the one I was mentioning that's kind of interesting. It really has only one insertion, um, and it's relatively smaller repeat, but it makes a very large number of foci. So we're trying to understand exactly why that is. Um, but it's, the quantitation is pretty similar to in case, some cases you see in humans, and I, I think we're trying to do other brain regions. We don't have quantitation on every brain region yet to kind of compare to what Stuart you know, mentioned uh, and so forth um, in different brain regions. Yeah, it can range. Uh, you know, we, we tend to show ones that have more than one, but there are many that have one focus. So we, 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 could, we probably should measure it in several different ways to look at focus burden. We've not done that yet. Um, and then in, in collaboration with Len, we've been looking at, at uh, RAN products. And, and in fact, um, we're still working on doing immunostaining because uh, it's not worked as well for us. We've had some trouble with background in mouse tissue. Um, but his uh, ELISA assay is actually seems to be working rel quite well. Um, so in terms of from soluble brain tissue, we've been able to see pretty high levels of uh, soluble GP proteins and uh, two of the different, this is the two repeat control here, so it overexpresses C9 but doesn't have repeats, and then in the 112 and 113, two of the higher level expressing. We can see these. You can also see some insoluble, but it, you can look at the, uh, the Y axis, it's, it's a bit lower level. Uh, but they're clearly there. So we're not sure, and we're going we're gonna to have to work on looking at carefully P62 staining, uh, poly-GP staining, et cetera, to see if um, the, the number of foci, or sorry, aggregates seems to be lower. And I think, as we discussed earlier, what aggregates mean versus the quantity of GP protein, it may be different. 
Um, and then this is, you know, really hot off the presses. I, I don't know is just that it, it seems like it, it, at least similar to the humans, cerebellar tissues make more of these uh, uh, products in spinal cord relatively less. But I think we're going to have to really get this pinned down a, a little bit more. So what's wrong with these mice? Is anything wrong with these mice? Well, we've only had them for uh, about a year. I mean, more than that for the founders, but cohorts sizable enough to do behavior for, you know, uh, about a year. So we have a, an eight-month time point in terms of behavior. We've been letting them go longer. Um, and we have a lot of graphs that look like this. I'm not going to show all of them. Uh, this is the spontaneous open field data showing that the wild types versus the hemizygous don't seem to have any difference. Um, and, and I should point out, as I, as I didn't before, but this has all been in collaboration with Jackson Laboratory. These, actually, many of these mice are housed at Jackson, um, and we're working closely with them on the behavior studies. Um, we don't see, uh, at least in the Y maze, you saw this earlier from, from Lionel, it, it's sort of an interesting result, which you might expect because mice like to explore novel environments, and if they can't remember what novel environments are, you might see a decrease in this measure. If anything, they seem to explore novel environments more, which I don't understand. Are they, are they psychotic? Are they hypervigilant? Are they really smart? Um, or is this just another, you know, mouse behavior study? <laughs> Um, so, so, but one could easily say that despite all the burden in the hippocampus at this point, we're not seeing a memory deficit, at least by a Y-maze study. And the only thing that we're finding at this point is that they have a, a, what looks to be a learning deficit in rotorod performance. So that in serial trials of rotorod, the mutant transgenics seem to not improve in their function, whereas the wild types do. And, you know, we are, have to do larger numbers, we have to do... Um, the wild type to repeat over expressors, and those, those are coming soon. Um, but this is hard to say. This actually could be and has been seen in, in Friedrich's taxia model mice, so mo mice that have cerebellar dysfunction have this type of a problem in motor learning. Um, I think I'd be a little disappointed if the one type of neurodegeneration that's not really been seen in C9 patients is the type that the mice get, cerebellar division. <laughs> but we're going to have to see. So. That's it. Uh, you know, I, I, the summary is that, that certainly the IPS cells are very interesting. They, they support the gain of function abnormalities. They don't have much for loss of function. And the mouse models are really in early stage. Um, and I'm hoping that we can, in addition to the pathology that we see, see some manifestations in these mice. So I've got to thank the members of our lab, uh, our collaborators, some are in the room, uh, Len, of course, uh, as well as those at UCLA who do the electrophys, Kat Lutz and Laurent at Jackson Laboratory are doing a ton of work on this, um, our I ISIS collaborators, and then all those who supported our work. So thank you.